A pleasure to be introducing such a wonderful, esteemed group of people, uh, a wonderful dynamic duo, in a sense. Um, over the past couple of days, I've had the opportunity to, to um, meet Shauna and learn from her and to meet David as well, too. And, and they're such a gracious couple, uh, inspiring in the work that they do. And um, an espionage restaurant? Amazing. Amazing. <laughs> so um, this talk is entitled Reluctant Fundamentalists. Fundamentalisms. No, no. no, it's not. <laughs> no, it's not. <laughs> no, it isn't. <laughs> Are you Shibana? <laughs> it features, it features um, Shauna Singh Baldwin <laughs> and uh, Ms. Satinder Baines. <laughs> Satinder Ji has been a great inspiration for me. Uh, at University of Fraser Valley, she does this amazing work with the Center for Indo Canadian Studies. And in terms of research, in terms of documenting the stories of the community and telling that story, it's an important one to tell. And I think she does an amazing job. And I couldn't think of a better person to be interviewing Shauna, mm -hmm. whose own work deals with the issues of, that are so important to all of us, of gender, of ethnicity, of identity, and of being in this world and the tensions that come from it. So without further ado, Shauna Singh Baldwin and Sassandra Baines. <laughs> well, thank you, Srish, and thank you, Naveen. Um, welcome to BC, Shana Ji. Thank you um, so much. Again, you've come a few times. Yes. It's our pleasure to have you with us today. And thank you for spending this time with us. Um, You're always the attraction. You oh, realize. yes, she says that. <laughs> um, I remember when I read your first book, The English Lessons and Other Short Stories. I didn't know you, but I, was a, I always consider myself a fairly new immigrant. I've been here about 35 years. And I was just mesmerized by your stories and a lot of them from your own immigrant experience in Montreal. And then I just kept reading and then I had the good fortune of meeting you. And I know in the audience people um, have read your books and they're deeply appreciative of what you write. Uh, we are indebted to you for your art, for your words, for your skill, for your lyrical way of writing, uh, the beauty of your stories. Um, so we are very pleased that you're here with us. So we're going to have a bit of a discussion with Shauna. Um, right off the bat, we know that you're a daughter of many countries. You've been in Canada, you've been in India, you live in the U.S., and countries around the world who've translated your books and people thirst to read your stories. And yet I read that you said, I never fit in anywhere. I've been a minority in three different countries, so I'm quite comfortable with the idea of being uncomfortable. So let me ask you, which question, out of all the questions you've been asked, in any country, makes you the most uncomfortable? <laughs> well, uh, I don't have to think much on that one, because one question actually sticks out in my mind. Um, after uh, What the Body Remembers, it was uh, my first interview with a South Asian journalist who shall be nameless. <laughs> and he said, so, when did you first get sucked into Western feminism? Mm. And it took me a little bit. And I replied, and I'm still proud of the answer, I replied, 1469 or maybe a few decades later. Mm. But that was uh, quite a, an introduction in those days because, you know, um, there were so few of us who were writing. Uh, Anita Rao Badami was writing um, about Indians. Um, Bharti Mukherjee had written about Indians in Canada and, and people were annoyed at her for some reason or the mm -hmm. other at that time and, and I caught a, caught a bit of the brunt of it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, um, so, but as I went on the tour for What the Body Remembers, there were other things that kept coming up um, to make you uncomfortable and some of it was how dare you write about women in India when you don't live there. Uh, how dare you write about the partition when your family didn't suffer half as much as mine. How dare you write about um, a time where you were not born, you know? Mm. So these questions made me uncomfortable, but you still, as an artist, are supposed to expect them. 
Mm-hmm. And you push the boundaries. I hope so, but you know, the boundaries I didn't know were there, mm. really, at the time. Mm. I just was telling a story. Mm. <laughs> so. And so other people also put artificial boundaries around you and your thinking as well. Yes, but you don't know what those boundaries are going to be, so why not just you know, write. Do, write your story? <laughs> so. Well, you have a new book out uh, called The Selector of Souls. Mm-hmm. It's a complex contemporary story, and it's set in two continents. And the two continents that we're all familiar with, some of us anyway, is India and Canada. Tell us a little bit about Selector of Souls. Uh, well... I didn't set out to write a 500-page book, I assure you. (laughs) So um, I am very grateful for anyone who who, uh, goes through the whole book because uh, it begins with, um, and and it began for me with the writing, uh, with some stories that wouldn't go away. And uh, one of them was from English Lessons, uh, a story in there called A Pair of Ears. And uh, there was a woman in that story, and she refused to go away. And so I uh, asked her, why are you still upset? And it's from her answers and um, from interviewing her in my head, perhaps, um, that Damani's story began to take shape. Um, And and about that same time, um, I was also interested in... Uh, other images that were coming to mind which were um, set in the Himalayas and the Shimla area and I know you have a lot of nostalgia for there and I went to school at uh, Jesus and Mary College in in, uh, um, Shimla and so many of those images were coming back of the mountains of uh, a little chapel in the mountains and what was it doing there and why was this nurse over there and what was she doing and so there were all these questions Um, but when you (laughs) <laughs> when you finally get through writing, and I, I won't bore you with the details because why should a reader care what you go through in order to write? <laughs> you know, um, There are two stories that are braided, and these stories come together. This woman who is about 50 years old commits a terrible crime at the beginning of the novel, and the question becomes, how does she try to recover from it? How do you recover from doing something mm. so terrible? How do you... Uh, make things better Mm. and um, it's also equally the journey of Anu in the book and she's a woman who is a survivor of domestic violence and her story really doesn't begin until she decides to do something about it and uh, in doing something she falls into an area that she thought would be very comfortable but isn't And we all do this from time to time, and she has to figure her way out of it as well. Well, I was interested to read Damini's story. Mm -hmm. Uh, You've given Damini this really deep and abiding will that is, is rare for women, or rarely seen in women. Yet it is the power of women that you have shown so eloquently. And you've also shown how she harnesses that power, regardless of having done this really horrible thing in the beginning of the book. Tell us about how you gave Damini that abiding spirit and that abiding will. Well, Damini doesn't have a lot of choices. And uh, um, you spoke in the last session about uh, your daughter telling you, for instance, to make good choices. That is not an option for many women uh, in two-thirds of the world. You don't have choices, so you make the best choice you can. And... Many of us have grown up with women in our families who've made the best they could of the circumstances or the best choices they could possibly make for survival. And she, uh, Damini, is indomitable in that sense that she's never been wanted, but by God, she's here anyway. You know? mm-hmm. And so she's going to make the best of it. And she's also very conscious of the fact that she's not... Um, She's not well healed. She is not from the Saab log. She, is, uh, she has a chip on her shoulder about not being from the Saab log. And little people like her don't have choices. And for instance, they don't get depression. That is a luxury that only you know, Saab women can afford. So there are things that she has limited uh, herself to also. Mm. And uh, she has to figure out what she can change and what she can't. 
Mm-hmm. So. And she's driven by her own necessities as well yes. throughout the book. Yes, she has to survive, but she also has to make sure that uh, her family survives. And in India particularly, um, you know, there's no social insurance, there's no Tommy Douglas who came along and said, you know, uh, free health care for all and it shall be all good. <laughs> uh, so in her case, she... Uh, realizes that her uh, her retirement is basically gone, she has to break the taboo against living with a daughter. And this is a taboo that, of course, uh, is one of those things we don't 